Hi, uh, my name is uh, Johan Hovold. I work as a consultant doing uh, kernel work primarily for embedded systems. I maintain the kernels uh, USB serial, GNSS, and uh, Grey Bus subsystems. And today I'll be talking about Lunar's ARM laptop project, which I've spent the last year and a half working on. Uh, some of you have probably heard about the Windows and ARM marketing term, uh, which is used for laptops built on 64-bit ARM SOCs. Uh, they tend to be built by Qualcomm. I don't think that's a requirement strictly. And uh, running Windows. Uh, these devices have some nice properties. They are quiet, power efficient, uh, but they also have some quirks. They come with a non-standard boot chain and rely on having a fairly heavily, uh, heavily modified customized OS uh, to run. Uh, the question naturally arises, uh, what would it take to run Linux on these? Uh, and this was the question that Linar set out to answer uh, in a project funded by ARM, uh, also indirectly by Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm and Lenovo provided some hardware we could use. And the idea was to do a proof of concept. Is it at all possible to run mainline Linux on these machines, that these ARM laptops that have been built for Windows? Uh, and basically see how far we could get initially. Uh, the primary developers, uh, developers here have been myself and Bjorn Andersson, who used to lead Linar's Qualcomm landing team and the landing team itself. Uh, but obviously we were building on work done by Qualcomm Linar over the years in upstreaming support for these SOCs. And since this is Linux, many, many other people. So I'll start with giving some more background on the project uh, before um, uh, discussing where we are today and say something about what we're currently working on. And after that, I wanted to highlight a couple of generic issues that we, we've identified uh, that are still unresolved. And after that, I'll get back to uh, some set of instructions on how to get started with the X13S and uh, just say something about uh, distribution support. Um, so, there's been some previous work, uh, collaboration between Dinar and ARM on this. Uh, um, initially, just trying to get these Windows and ARM laptops to at all boot. Spent a lot of time just getting the bootloader to start. Uh, once we were past that, uh, we were able to enable some uh, basic features. And that, those projects it did a bit of investigation on how to best support these devices for, for, with the uh, eye of, of a distribution. For example, they use uh, ASPI for booting, uh, whereas uh, the Linux support for ARM is, seems to work better with uh, device tree. Um, doc the findings of these projects were documented in a GitHub project called Arch64 Laptops, and a mailing list and an IRC channel was set up with a bit of uh, community uh, forming around it. Uh, but these earlier devices were not very powerful. They often tended to uh, remind more of a phone or a tablet in a, a laptop uh, form factor. Uh, and this is unlike the device that we now get access to, the uh, Snapdragon-based ThinkPad called X13S. So it's a third-generation uh, compute platform uh, called SC8280XP. That's what we're referring to it as uh, upstream. Uh, has a pretty powerful GPU uh, and all the features you expect from a modern laptop. Um, yeah, and the picture here is it's the device that I'm using right now. Uh, the boot firmware running in these devices is a, a UEFI firmware uh, by Qualcomm, uh, which has some quirks. Uh, for example, the EFI runtime services are not available uh, once uh, the boot services exit. Uh, so you can't use the standard interfaces for accessing things like EFI variables. Uh, they come with a very non-standard uh, implementation of ACPI. Uh, so basically, one of the outcomes of these early projects was that it's not feasible to support these laptops booting uh, over ACPI for anything uh, beyond possibly a, a basic boot. Uh, and instead, uh, they created a, um, some people at Lenar at the time created an EFI application that can be used to load a device tree blob, install it in the ACPI tables, uh, EFI tables, and um, so you can ship the D2B uh, device tree blob with the firmware, and this would install uh, instead and uh, later allow for generic distribution installers. Uh, another quirk with this boot firmware is that the 
Qualcomm is starting a hypervisor uh, uh, before. So, so the UE5 firmware in Linux actually starts in execution level one. Uh, and this means that you won't have any uh, uh, hardware virtualization. So how do we go about with this? Obviously, we had a long list of features that we wanted to implement support for and get upstream. Uh, this turned out to involve a fair bit of reverse engineering because of uh, lack of documentation, uh, incomplete documentation. Uh, we did a fair share of, uh, well, run into issues in, in, in mainline and added support. We've accrued technical depth upstream, which we need to uh, deal with. This was particularly true for enabling support for the four-lane PCIe files that these devices use. Uh, we also initiated a discussion with uh, Lenovo and Qualcomm in order to try to get firmware release. So once we had the features uh, upstream, firmware would ideally be available in the Linux firmware as well. Uh, we've fixed a lot of bugs as part of the project uh, in the upstream support that was already up. Uh, reviewing patches to make sure that code that goes in and that we care about meets the, what, the, the upstream or what should be the upstream kernel standards, um, tracking the patches as uh, make sure everything gets in in a timely fashion. And for that, having uh, publishing some work in progress branches turned out to be uh, fairly uh, uh, useful. I'll get back to those in a minute. Uh, we've had early adopters using those uh, early release branches and uh, being able to run uh, uh, Linux on their devices and we've been working on supporting them. They've been finding bugs, we've been fixing them and so on. So uh, the VIP branches uh, is basically my development branch. Uh, it's what I'm running on, on, on my device and it has all the important features for fixes that we've uh, found and fixed but which haven't made it into uh, uh, mainline yet and also features that are under development that I deem to be stable enough that I want to run it on my own machine. Uh, that typically means that I've reviewed it myself. Uh, I know that there's nothing really bad lurking there. Uh, I've included a minimal UNDEF config in these branches, uh, which has all the services documentation for what features you need to enable for a distribution, for example, that want to add support for these devices. Uh, I've been rebasing on RC kernels, releasing whenever there's something important, updated, uh, pushing it out. And by staying this close to mainline, obviously we found a lot of regressions early on. For example, in 6.5, there was a regression with Wi-Fi, which locked up the machine completely. It turned out to be a generic issue in the core interrupt uh, handling code, which uh, uh, we were able to fix, and I got fixed in just before 6.5 was released, so hopefully not that many people were bitten by this. So far, it's been 41 branches that I pushed out. The latest one is based on 66RC2. And I uh, typically announce these on this R64 laptop's uh, IRC channel. So we get testing by early adopters. Some people repackage it with a distribution config. And it's also been the base for images for distributions that just Ubuntu, who's been involved in this early on in uh, providing distribution support. Uh, I mentioned device firmware. Um, we've been using the firmware from the Windows installation for bring up, uh, but we obviously need, can't distribute this ourselves, so we've been working with Lenovo and Qualcomm and try to get that firmware released and upstream. Uh, this has typically been working quite well, but for example, the Wi-Fi board file that came with the Windows uh, installation isn't compatible with the firmware that the Linux uh, Wi-Fi driver uses. And getting that, uh, out, getting access to it, and getting it into Linux firmware took almost exactly a year. But today, everything but uh, the video acceleration firmware is in Linux firmware, and we expect to have the missing bits there pretty soon, too. So, where do we stand today? Uh, well, uh, we got uh, the basic device tree, base device tree into 6.0, 6 uh, along with uh, support for USB, keyboard backlight, 6.1 added support for system suspend, so we could survive that at least. I mentioned PCIe took a bit of time to get in because of the refactoring that had to be done upstream. Uh, but once we had that, we had the NVMe SSD and we could boot off. Uh, 6.3 added support for external and internal display, uh, which meant that we were now down to a single patch that we needed to, to boot mainline, and that was a quirk that was needed for the IOMMU because of the interaction with this hypervisor that Qualcomm is running. 
Uh, Wi-Fi was not enabled into 6.4 because of the time it took to get access to the board file. Uh, I also wrote here about the uh, touchpad, the alternate touchpad. I'll get back to that in a minute, of why that took some time to get supported as well. Uh, with 6.5, uh, we have audio and GPU as well. And, um, well, basically feature complete. I'm traveling with this laptop. It's my primary device. Uh, the only thing that's missing from 6.5 is perhaps camera. You can use a USB webcam for that for now. But uh, we're also working on that. But, yeah. Uh, work in progress. Camera is on the way, at least in some sense. Uh, we probably won't be able to use the full pipeline that's uh, for, for doing hardware processing of the images, but raw sensor data can be read out, and you can do some processing in, uh, in user space, amending lib camera with support for this. And it seems to work well enough for, uh, for doing video conferencing, for example. Uh, but there are a lot of missing pieces there in the, the user space support. Uh, I mentioned the five arrivals earlier. Uh, Maximilian Lutz from the Arch64 community did a, a great job in reverse engineering the interface that Qualcomm uses to talk directly to the secure uh, world firmware uh, so that we can access the five arrivals. You don't need to use them uh, from day to day, but it's obviously a good feature to have for distributions. Um, we have support for a fingerprint reader and video acceleration working. Uh, it's not upstream yet, it needs a bit of polishing but it's supported in the VIP branches. Uh, USB-C muxing uh, is working, but we need to make some changes to the display stack to be able to support four-lane uh, display ports. Uh, we're aware of some performance optimizations that needs to be done, uh, particularly the algorithm for uh, memory bus scaling needs to be improved somewhat, should be able to push the performance somewhat. And we're constantly working on improving the power consumption uh, power consumption situation. Uh, but already today, uh, we're at a, a 15 hours of, of idle time uh, with the backlight at a comfortable 66%, uh, which is quite usable. Uh, suspend, on the other hand, we're not yet hitting the deepest uh, low power states, which means that you can, you can uh, close the lid of your laptop. It will suspend, but you need to find a charger within 30 hours or so. Uh, the firmware doesn't support anything but suspend to idle. That's the only thing that Windows uses these days. Audio uh, is working with 6.5, as I mentioned. Um, we had a late fix for um, uh, headphone distortion, which exposed a, a problem with uh, an issue with the, the Linux audio stack. And that is that you have three different components that need to be updated in, in lockstep kernel, uh, so-called topology file describing the, the audio topology, and a use case manager configuration file. Um, and in this case, uh, the, the changes were not backwards compatible, so you, yeah, you, it could be an issue for distribution support, for example. Uh, hopefully, we won't have any more of these uh, major updates coming, but we do have a known issue with microphone distortion, which could potentially need something like that. Uh, there were also some minor issues with pops and clicks, sound artifacts. Uh, there's a partial fix in the VIP branch, but uh, needs to be generalized for going upstream. Uh, we have GPU support. Uh, I don't uh, tend to play games myself, but uh, people do, and it seems to be a pretty powerful uh, GPU. Uh, Rob Clark, the maintainer of the free Adreno driver, helped us to get support for the A690 GPU into MESA 23.1. Uh, there was an important fix in 23.1.4, so make sure you get a version that's more recent than that. Uh, we've been using uh, extracted GMU firmware, which is part of the GPU, uh, well, GPU support. Um, for, for bring up, we weren't able to get that one released in Interlinux firmware in time, so we've been told by Qualcomm that we can use the GMU firmware from a previous uh, version of the hardware. So, and the driver will be using this from 6.6, and it's been backported to 6.5.3, so before that, you may just need to add a, a symbol for it. Bluetooth support's been uh, upstream since 6.4, uh, but there are 
some missing pieces there, uh, and one of those is that the device lacks a unique device address. Or actually, it has, but it's stored externally from the device itself. So we need details from Qualcomm in order to uh, be able to access that, or we need to embark on another reverse engineering expedition. Uh, unfortunately, there is no support in uh, Blue's, Bluetooth daemon for uh, setting a custom address or generating a random one at boot. Hans de Goethe, who's here today, uh, identified this issue a few years back because it applies generally to other controllers as well. Uh, but this means that you need to set the device address uh, manually or create your custom systemd service for, for setting it for now. Uh, there is a similar problem with the Wi-Fi MAC address, but uh, their situation is somewhat better because we fall back to a, a random address. So you don't have collisions if you're using the same device in an audience like this. Um, Qualcomm uh, remote processors, a lot of functionality in these devices are in, implemented by uh, co-processors, and uh, for that, you need to have the Qualcomm so-called protection domain mapper daemon running. Uh, it sh uh, ships a configuration file with the uh, remote proc firmware, and basically tells the remote processor which services to start, and tells the kernel where to find those services. And it's in these machines, it's used to implement the audio, uh, the battery driver, and uh, USB-C alternate mode and orientation switching. So a thing to watch out for there is to make sure you have the PD mapper running because depending on the firmware version, your battery may not charge otherwise. Mine doesn't have that problem, but some users have reported that. Um, there's another uh, service that needs to be running as well. This is something that ideally should be moved into the kernel so we don't have to depend on uh, everyone installing and running such services, uh, and possibly have part of the description moving into a device tree as well. Okay, so that was what we're working on currently and some of the status, uh, and now I wanted to discuss a couple of issues that are generic and doesn't just apply to, to these machines and that we've identified as part of the project. Uh, and one of those is the issue of second source devices. So this particular laptop comes with one out of two different uh, touchpad controllers. And you can't really tell uh, which device has which. Um, and instead, the boot firmware goes out and probes and makes sure to check is this device available in this address or that address and determine which is populated. Ideally, the firmware should update the uh, device tree accordingly so the kernel knows uh, where to look for the touchpad. So, simple example, somewhat simplified. We have two uh, touchpads, uh, two different SPC addresses sitting on the same bus, uh, described as sitting on the same bus. They use the same interrupt resources, the same power supply, uh, but they are both marked as disabled in, um, see if this works, uh, in the device tree. The boot firmware uh, goes out and probes them and enables the one that's actually populated and then hands this final uh, device tree over to the kernel. Uh, this, however, is not implemented by the x S firmware. It does the probing, but it doesn't do the uh, ticket update. Uh, why don't you just enable the two in the device tree, and then uh, I to see it would. Uh, I'll get to that. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the x S doesn't support it, uh, which means the Linux needs to probe both of them instead. Uh, and. For that, we can rely on the head driver, uh, which already has this check for making sure that a device is populated. And this is used with this particular device, for example, for touchscreen. Some of these devices have a touchscreen, some doesn't, and some don't. And uh, we mark it as enabled in the device tree. The kernel goes out and probe, and otherwise fails out silently. So this is the code that does that. Power on the device, uh, make a dummy read, and if nothing replies, if it times out, bail out silently, and all is good. Otherwise, you allocate your hit device and register it with driver core. So what we need to do currently with the kernel, and it's been done by a Chromebook, for example, before us, we weren't the first to do this, uh, is to do exactly that. We enable both and let the kernel probe. And this works fine, uh, but at least as long as these devices are probed uh, sequentially. But that's not the way the kernel works these days. Uh, we do uh, asynchronous probing, we probe in parallel. And one of the first issues that we ran into was a, another uh, issue in the uh, core interrupt mapping code. Uh, 
which is a general issue that affects all devices with shared interrupts. Uh, and it could mean that you, if they probe in parallel and go out and, and try to request a mapping for, for the same hardware interrupt line, you can end up with two different mappings. And one, once we got the touchpad interrupts, those were uh, attributed to the, to the other mapping, which we weren't using, dismissed the spurious, and, well, the touchpad didn't work. Uh, I fixed up that locking in uh, 6.4, uh, so we were able to uh, enable the, the alternate touchpad back then. Uh, but that's not all. Um, there could be resources, like here we're using regulators. Those can be shared. You can have two devices powered on, and it will remain on until both of them uh, try to disable it. But there are resources that cannot be uh, acquired uh, in parallel. And for those, you need to make sure that the driver checks that the device is populated before acquiring those resources. And uh, we just had a regression in 6.6. Uh, uh, RC1, where someone changed the probe order of the hit driver, which meant that the interrupt was now requested before making sure that the device was there. We got a, one of these false sharing situations and probe failed again. I sent a patch to, to revert that or reorder the, the probe uh, so that it works. But it kind of highlights an issue with this, that there, it's a generic problem here. For example, if you have a recent GPIO, that needs to be involved when uh, doing the uh, power on. And for that, uh, you, you may not be able to do the sharing. You need to do it sequentially. Can we come back to questions afterwards? Or? Oh, well, it's, okay. it's about the reset GPIO. So Linux also has a concept called reset controllers. And those can be shared. So if you model the reset. And I think a lot of the resources which you need for just to see if the device is there, like regulators and clocks, can already be shared. So I'm not sure if we need all the complexity of the proposal you're heading towards. Some things can be shared, absolutely. But for example, reset controller can be marked as exclusive. If you need to do a toggling of the reset line, and you have two uh, devices running, two threads running in parallel, toggling device, uh, the, the reset line, obviously, they can interfere with each other. So for the general solution, you, we need something else. Uh, and there are also devices that are, uh, some reasons that are even allocated or requested before the hit driver probes. Uh, pin configuration, for example, is, is uh, requested already by driver core, and in order to handle that, you need to move the pin configuration up to the parent node so that those devices don't stamp on each other, or you amend the pin control subsystem to allow sharing uh, a pin configuration as long as it's compatible, basically the same uh, configuration. But the conclusion is indeed that uh, in order to solve this generally, we probably need to extend the uh, uh, device tree specification to somehow be able to mark these devices as mutually exclusive so that the OS knows that do not try to probe these in parallel, uh, things will go bad and force sequential probe. Sure. I have a question from the stream, so I'm forwarding what they are asking. Okay. Um, so the question is, what is limiting Qualcomm from providing more support instead of working all around these issues? Say again. What is limiting Qualcomm from providing more support instead of working around all these issues? Uh, well, Qualcomm isn't uh, directly involved in this. OK. Uh, that's a simple question. But, um, but this, isn't a, this isn't a Qualcomm issue either. It's not an issue with this laptop. It's a general issue with, with Linux, with the uh, device tree, and with, uh, well, in this case, on the hit drive. Um, the other issue, uh, and this is this discussion has restarted now with the uh, regression in 6.6 RC1. So um, these are things we'll probably be resolved soon. Uh, the other issue I wanted to discuss was uh, it's related to bootloader handover. So uh, the bootloader uh, enables resources, for example, for the display, to show a splash screen or something, and uh, this could be like clocks, regulators, power domain, interconnects, and um, there could also be stuff that's been enabled already by, by the boot drum, and the boot firmware simply leaves it enabled. And handing those resources over to the kernel should be as seamless as possible. You don't want to have the display go, display go black, uh, but you also want to make sure that you're able to, at some point, disable resources that are not needed uh, in order to save power. Uh, and there are some problems with the way that Linux handles this uh, upstream, uh, or Linux handles this today. Uh, for example, the clock and power domain subsystems 
disables any resources that the kernel, uh, to the kernel appears to be unused already at late in it. And if you build your display driver as a, as a module, that module hasn't been loaded yet, so the, the resource looks unused. Uh, those subsystems will go out and disable uh, regulators, uh, display clocks, and things break. The workaround here, which uh, is used on a lot of devices, including uh, those Qualcomm laptops, is to pass the clock ignore and use, the PD ignore and use kernel parameters, which basically takes the system to, to ignore any resources that appear to be used, just leave them on. And this obviously has the potential to be wasting a lot of power if there are resources which are truly unused, unlike, for example, the display clock. Uh, another problem with this is that if you have uh, modular clock drivers uh, disabling unused resources already at late in it before modules have been loaded can be done, it can be too soon, so that uh, those resources will be left on indefinitely as well. Uh, for regulators, uh, it used to work the same way. Uh, regulators that were seemingly unused were disabled at late in it, but a few years back, a 30 second uh, delay, a timeout was added, and that improved things quite a bit uh, with very simple means. Uh, it handles the, the handover issue as long as the display uh, pipeline, the modules are loaded within 30 seconds, which is typically the case. But there are still some issues with this solution, and that is that for example, if you need an, an early console, a uh, rescue shell, or if you need to enter a password for your full disk encryption, uh, the display backlight re regulator, for example, uh, can be in, uh, turned off 30 seconds before you have time to enter your password or if, well, you're in your rescue shell. <clears throat> and thirdly, uh, the interconnect subsystem uses a different mechanism for syncing its state and that is to be, that's based around the so-called sync state mechanism, which means that once all uh, consumers of the interconnect, users of it, have been bound to their drivers, we call the sync state callback, uh, which means that you can reduce the clocks uh, and power resources of the interconnect, which is typically running at full speed uh, when we start the kernel. Uh, this obviously has uh, a problem with this is that, for example, if one of those drivers fails to probe, then the power step will be left at, at maximum uh, forever forward. Uh, and this can happen if a firmware file is missing. I mentioned before we don't have access to the video acceleration firmware yet. If someone hasn't installed that, you can end up with your uh, interconnect running at maximum power. Uh, or if simply a driver has been disabled in a distribution conflict. So this is the problem, and obviously it seems we need some kind of common mechanism for um, disabling such unused re resources. It could be built on a sync state mechanism so that it triggers when all the consumer's drivers are bound, but we may also need that timeout to handle uh, drivers that fail to probe missing firmware and so on. Uh, we could use a, a mechanism similar to what we do for uh, deferred probing, extend the timer every time a driver is bound to make it a, more, a bit more flexible. Uh, than having a fixed 30 second timeout, uh, but, and then we trigger the state sync on, uh, on expiry. Uh, but the problem with that approach, obviously, is that if you have a rescue shell, you need to be able to pause that timer somewhere. So you need to teach user space, your specific rescue shell, user space at least, for disabling that or the, the password prompt. Uh, and the alternative could be then to instead teach user space how to tell Linux when the system is fully booted so we know that we won't be loading any more modules uh, any resources that are still uh, running but unclaimed, uh, turn them off. We don't need it anymore. And there is uh, a SysFS interface for this in the sync state implementation, which could probably be, be, be used for it. And as long as everyone's using the same user space, for example, systemd, uh, that could be a way of, of implementing this. But this is uh, an unresolved issue, there's been some attempts to solve it partially uh, from Google, for example, uh, some, some work from Linaro, uh, but it remains unsolved currently. Hi, so uh, for the, specifically the display part, since you're replacing EFI and ACPA with device tree anyway, I hit the same issue on all winner boards like five, six years ago, and the simple FB description now allows you to list clocks and regulators which the display needs. And then a simple FB kernel driver or simple DRM will just keep the clocks and regulators enabled until it is replaced by the real driver. So I think at least for the display part, this should be fixed if you just put the clocks and regulators in your simple FB node. In your? Simple F, so, so 
Um, simple FP. Yeah, simple FP is, is one way to do this. It's uh, basically you would have two descriptions of your display pipelines in your device tree. You'd have one describing the resources that needed for, for the firmware setup, the five frame buffer, and one describing the, the pipeline that the actual will be using. The problem is that the display pipeline these days is, is quite complicated. There are a lot of resources involved. Interconnects, for example, are not modeled by or used by the simple frame buffer driver. And uh, you could have, so essentially you would be doubling the work. Uh, and it would be a one-off kind of thing. You would be describing your display pipeline for the actual display, and then you'll sort of work around this issue by describing each and every resource that's needed in, in another node in the device tree. But sure, it, it works for simple cases, but it doesn't work currently uh, for, for complex uh, pipelines like this one. But you could just basically list all the clocks and all the regulators which the display might use. So then you just keep them on until uh, uh, the, re the actual display driver replaces it. So you only have the higher power consumption for a short while during boot. Because I know the state sync stuff, or all state sync is new to me, but I know the timeout approach or the late init approach. And this has always been going in circles around this for like a decade at least. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's been there for a long time, absolutely. And, and for example, just adding that 30 second delay solves the problem, but you still then have an issue with the rescue shell, for example. And, and I end up, if I need to uh, debug an early boot issue, I go in and, and just mark, mark those regulators as always on so that I can keep on display on for a bit. Yep. Right, but so instead of always on, you could just put them in a simple FB node, right? Then mm. you still get the power saving later on. But solving this, it needs to be solved in a general way still to, to not have to have that dupli duplicated description of uh, basically working around what's an issue in, in, in the kernel. Okay, uh, so that was the open issues, generic issues. We have a few more bits uh, to, uh, for adding support for, 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 the, for this particular laptop. Uh, I mentioned the uh, camera image sensor processor. Uh, we probably won't be able to do that. We won't be able to do it ourselves. We need Qualcomm's involvement, uh, releasing documentation, uh, probably have to do it themselves. Uh, but the path forward there otherwise would be uh, a user space implementation meanwhile. Uh, virtualizations, similarly, uh, only Qualcomm can fix their firmware and, and release something that allows us to, to for example, run KVM on this. Uh, I also already mentioned the Bluetooth uh, and Wi-Fi MAC address. We're trying to get access to documentation there. Uh, we looked a little bit at hibernation. That basically means we need to add support to a lot of drivers which currently don't care about hibernation, don't know how to save and restore its state. Uh, there are some special keys on the, on the keyboard, uh, mic mute and, and camera block, that would be good to have support for, but we haven't looked at that yet. Uh, thermal throttling we do, uh, but we only throttle the CPU. And for those people that are doing heavy gaming, uh, the device can get too warm. So we need to implement support for throttling the, at least the GPU as well, but there are other components that could be used for this. There's a trusted platform module for storing keys in the device, which we haven't had time to look at yet. And there are some issues with uh, USB power delivery, which is uh, not fully implemented yet. So if you're plugging in some of these adapters with uh, uh, a power supply as well, it, it may not charge. Um, yeah. OK, uh, if you want to get started with your X13S, just to exemplify where we are today, you basically only need this. You need a reason kernel. You can run mainline or one of my VIP branches, for example, the 6.5 branch that I'm using on this one right now. Uh, you can use uh, UNF config as a starting point. Uh, it's enough to run the config I'm using, um, generalize it, enable all the other drivers you need. You need a recent Linux firmware. Um, the September release was just a few days ago. October works as well with an added symlink. Uh, just make sure you have the video acceleration firmware if, if you're running the VIP branch to avoid getting into that problem with the interconnect uh, not syncing. Uh, you need a recent outside UCM conf uh, plus uh, the volume fixes which have not been merged upstream yet. We hope to get this in this week, but it's an ex example of the, the problem I highlighted earlier of having three different components and you need to update them in lockstep and this one dragged on for various reasons. Uh, 
recent MESA 23.1.4 uh, or uh, newer, and make sure you have the PD mapper running. Uh, it's packaged on, on several distributions, uh, but perhaps not all of them. Uh, kernel command line, you need to pass for now the clock ignoring use and PD ignoring use parameters for this uh, handover issue that I talked about earlier. We have a firmware bug in the Lenovo firmware, uh, which means that you need to disable pointer authentication for now. Lenovo and Qualcomm are actively working on trying to fix this, uh, but we don't have a fix yet. Um, and also, because of this quirky EFI implementation, you need to pass EFI no runtime, at least with the older firmware. I think it's supposed to be addressed in, in the more recent one. Uh, we have an issue with uh, USB throughput, which can be worked around by uh, enabling this lazy IOMMU DMA mode. And we're also working on making sure that the PCIe ASPM, the low power mode there, power management mode, is enabled by default. But for now, you need to do it on the command line as well. And your inner TramFS, make sure you have the modules needed to boot, the NVMe driver, for example. If you need an early console, if you're doing full disk encryption, make sure you have the drivers for keyboard, backlight, and the display pipeline. Uh, the actual list here is going to depend on your configuration, but this one is based on the, the way you and Config looks. Um, and also note that if, if you're missing one of these uh, dependencies, it may cause the, the screen to go blank. Uh, and uh, yeah, it can be a bit of a pain to debug. And finally, uh, distribution supports. Uh, I'm running Arch Linux on this one. Uh, I'm building my own kernel, obviously. But the only package otherwise that I built is this ALSA UCM conf because of those late fixes that I haven't gone in. Otherwise, everything is, is available, even though there's no uh, official um, support for this device, for example, because everything is upstream now. Uh, Juventus has been involved uh, early on. Uh, they've done something they call uh, concept images. So that I haven't tried any of these myself, but that should be a good starting point uh, to have a USB stick plugin to try it out. Red Hat and Fedora are working on adding support, and there was rec just recently some uh, movement on Debian as well, adding um, a wiki page for how to install um, Debian on the X13S. But to sum up, uh, the Lenovo ThinkPad is well supported by mainline uh, 6.5. There's quite a few of kernel developers now using it as their primary device. Uh, there are some bits missing, uh, uh, but there's already more features in the pipeline, for example, camera. And we're actively working on improving the, particularly the uh, suspend power consumption. Thanks. Uh, so thanks a lot for all of this work. Um, the thing that concerns, worries me a little bit is that this started in 6.0. Uh, uh, now we're on 6.5 and it's working great. So that's, that's cool. Uh, but how much work um, you can roughly estimate it would be when the ThinkPad X13S new generation comes in to support this new one? So that has been a, a part of the project as well, of course, to make sure that we make sure that the upstream support is, uh, works well enough to make it easier to add new uh, support for new devices as they come along to root out, uh, find, identify all these generic issues and make sure that we have solutions for them in place by the time the next generation uh, comes out as well. So uh, just, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. just a short remark about the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi MAC address. It might be worthwhile to see if they're stored in UEFI variables. That happens sometimes on some devices. Yeah, uh, uh, some devices do that, uh, but not this one. Oh, you already um, checked, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so a follow-up question, question is, um, Google is actually pushing really hard vendors to actually submit code upstream. And so they have like some of the Chromebooks that are supported upstream first before they're actually uh, getting out. Is there any initiative on Linux 
so this is done uh, with some involvement from, from Qualcomm uh, uh, and Lenovo, but I mean the device was developed for, for ARM without any concern for, for uh, Linux whatsoever. Uh, everything is tailored for, for, for Windows. Uh, I don't know. I hope that the success of this pro project, proving that you can run mainline, that we can get everything up uh, upstream and, and just working with basically any distribution, will uh, start a process so that hopefully in the future uh, Linux will be supported out of the box when, when these devices are released. Thank you. Uh, just speak? Yeah. Uh, so regarding the problem with the shared I2C or the two I2C controllers where you just have one, so generally I think you should have like an EFI application that fixes up the device tree because it's a one-time thing. But uh, for runtime decisions there is a feature domain controller patch set that is in its fourth version now I think, which is about like hypervisors that want to do partitioning or uh, DDR firewalls where you want to disable part of the device tree that's status okay, but you have one central node that can runtime mark something as disabled and that would be um, a binding that you can make use of too. So that might be something you want to check out. Mm -hmm. Feature domain controller is its name. I don't know if they still keep the three words, but that should help you find it. Yeah, uh, but it sounds, okay, I'll take a look. But it sounds like a roundabout way of, of, of solving it, especially since the, the firmware, I mean, ideally the firmware will be updated to simply learn how to uh, patch device trees. Hi, um, uh, talking about Windows, they, do, do, you, do you know how much level of, how much things they have tuned to make this uh, Chromebook, this device work? Or it's uh, just a normal Windows? I haven't looked at the code. I don't know anything really about Windows. Uh, but I have heard that it's, it's quite a bit of work that needs to be done. For example, the ACPI implementation being quirky as it is, you need to complement that, uh, add a lot of information that should have gone in, in the firmware uh, inside the OS instead. And uh, for uh, so, of course, it's much simpler if we have a proper device tree definition uh, to support the device. Uh, but that means that for every single device, we need to provide that device tree and patch the framework. So, yep. is there any body working on a UFI only implementation for for Linux that takes care of all those quirks in? inside the OS? There are some, some people uh, looking at it uh, to be able to do something like, for example, run a, uh, a distro installer to be able to use the by frame buffer or something like that. But I think the general agreement is that it's, it's, it's a dead end. It's no, until uh, the firmware ACPI implementation, at least, is, is, is reworked, fixed, uh, it, it's simply not feasible to try to go that route with uh, Linux. Thank you. So one of the things on modern Windows systems is a thing called a PEP, P-E-P. -E I can't remember the exact name, but something like Platform Enhancement Package or whatever. Um, and that is what Microsoft recommend that people use to override ACPI tables and whatever and ship that through Windows Update. And hence, vendors like Qualcomm end up using that. And what they're effectively shipping is a bunch of board file drivers for Windows specifically. And hence, while well, we can't really consume the ACPI tables because in many cases, the information doesn't exist there. The infrastructure isn't necessarily in Windows, but it's in Qualcomm's PEP for Windows for this specific platform. Oh, boy. Does that mean we're going to have a project to uh, interpret uh, PEP and turn it into Vice Tree or something? No. Not unless you want to convert <laughs> arbitrary binaries arbitrary executable binaries to a data description format, which we don't really have a specification for in the first place. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, since you said you were using it for your main machine, uh, do you do builds natively for like the kernel and how long does it take? Uh, so I'm using this smaller uh, def config because I don't want to build drivers for architectures that I'm not interested in or machines that I'm not interested in. Uh, 
SLCs that are not interesting. It, it takes around uh, three and a half minutes or so to, to build a kernel on this one. Uh, with that config, uh, it's not a full blown all yes config or anything. Great, thanks. Overall, after all your work on this, are you happy with this machine? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, I am. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's it's light. I, I love the fact that there's no fan. It's the first time I've had a fanless machine. Uh, it's powerful enough. I, I haven't tried gaming on it, but it actually feels like I should try it at some point as well. It's the first that I've been using. Uh, uh, well, haven't really had a GPU for years either. Um, proper GPU. Uh, no, I, I'm happy with it. Uh, I mean, even. Power consumption now, where we are, 15 hours of idle time, it's, it's better than any of the, the x86 machines I've had. So. Absolutely. So for the MAC address, you could try scanning the I2C buses and see if you can find an EEPROM, read it out, boot into Windows, see what MAC address you get there, compare against the dump, and see if you can find it. We have an idea where it's stored. We basically probably need to talk to the secure world somewhere, uh, which have access to these resources, where it's stored. So that's the problem. We need to either get the information from Qualcomm on how to talk to uh, the, the part of the firmware that knows these addresses, or we need to figure it out ourselves. All right, thank you.